Good morning, class. I'm going to be talking to you about Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosopher born in 1905 and then died in 1980. So he's probably one of the most modern philosophers that we're going to experience in this class, having started from the pre-Socratics at the very beginning of the class. Here we are in the 1980s. Obviously, he's not a contemporary philosopher, but he kind of brings to a conclusion this Western philosophy survey, and Sartre is kind of like the bookend of our survey class. So obviously the name sounds French. He's from France, and he's, you know, the par excellence French philosopher, very proud of his French roots, and uh, was very much an urban philosopher, uh, although he traveled all over the world um, as a lecturer and as a writer. Um, his roots were always in Paris, where he made his home for most of his life, living in the famous West Bank, which is the near the University of Paris, kind of like the cultural bohemian part of Paris, uh, although he, he had regular night spots in places like Montmartre and in uh, other places um, in Paris as well. So um, he is... You know, when he died, there was like 40 or 50,000 Parisians out in the street. And I kind of want to start with that because I don't think that there'd be any writer or intellectual that could die in the United States or even in England and bring out 40 to 50,000 people in the street, as you'll see from the kind of image that I've imported here in the film, this little video that I'm making. Uh, Parisians take their philosophers and their intellectuals very, very seriously. And you can see that by the sincere outpouring. Sartre kind of like spanned that whole pre-war, pre-World War II generation. And then in the post-World War II liberation era, where Paris was seen kind of like to be the intellectual and literary and artistic um, capital of the world, where a lot of black jazz musicians who could not find work in the United States uh, would go to Paris and found an incredible openness in the Parisian people for their music. And being a black man, a former, let's say, GI service member in Paris, if you were black, um, the amazing sense of how they felt welcome, how Parisians, uh, maybe not in the whole of France, but certainly Parisians were hip and they were liberal, and they were open to kind of universal ideas. That's kind of like the, you know, the, the birthplace of Sartre. That's what kind of situates him as a writer, his, his city of Paris, and um, a progressive city, a city where art and expression and cabaret and dancing and gay art, Sartre's philosophy really started to take hold because he's talking about themes that encourage responsibility and individual. After World War II, the world was kind of ready for that because it had been at the brink of disaster. After we exploded the atomic bomb in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the world kind of felt, I mean, people felt like none of the old ideas about God and the state and government held up anymore because human madness and human irrationality could take um, could take hold at any one moment. So people were kind of like feeling, let's live for today. Let's be responsible for our own lives and let's stop relying on some kind of divine uh, interpretation of things, faith to make things right because humans are just too irrational. We have to find our own own way. Morality doesn't really work. People have to find their own way in life. And uh, so, and then in the 1960s, Sartre's emphasis on individuality and on creating yourself and on being true to yourself found a whole new generation of listeners in the countercultural movements, which was starting not only in the United States, but also in Mexico City and in. Paris and in London, there was this whole cultural uprising, the countercultural movement of the 1960s, and it had been starting for a while since the civil rights movements in the 1950s. The world was ready for a change after World War II, after the Korean War, after the Cold War. People were ready for a more 
mature interpretation of the world and, and uh, an interpretation in which people were going to be responsible for themselves. So that's kind of a, a broad overview of Sartre. Um, in that intellectual life, Sartre was always kind of like uh, at this cafe, they call it Café du Fleur, and uh, holding court with all the other French intellectuals at the time, like Albert Camus and André Malraux and Jean Genet, and of course his long-standing lover, Simone de Beauvoir, who was an intellectual uh, on his level. She wrote a very famous book called The Second Sex, and uh, Simone de Beauvoir is someone uh, worthy of your consideration, especially anybody interested in, in feminism and in you know, the you know, patriarchy and in the way um, a male-dominated view of the world is so toxic for humanity in terms of capitalism and excess and power and in uh, uh, kind of oppression. So if you're looking for ideas, Simone de Beauvoir, his longtime lover, is also a great source. And I populated the video with a couple of little quotations from her. Uh, just to keep her in mind. So in the 60s, Sartre had kind of a revival, and his popularity lasted all through the 70s and when he finally died in 1980. So um, one of the ideas that I'd like you to kind of keep in mind is that... Um, let's see if I can find the article. Excuse me. This is the article that you are going to be reading. I took a screenshot of this, but um, Camtasia won't let me import that a screenshot file. But anyway, uh, so this article that I just showed you is the article in Canvas that forms the basis of the questions that I'm going to be asking about Sartre on the final. So I'm going to go over some of the basic ideas that you will see in this article on Canvas uh, dealing with Jean-Paul Sartre. And the first thing to talk about is what is existentialism? Because typically when you hear of Sartre, the first thing that populates in any Google search is Sartre and then existentialism. So what is that term in case you've ever heard of it before? Existentialism. And it kind of goes back a century or so before Sartre, starting with the work of a Danish philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, um, who, who wrote about the, the existential condition of a human being that must make sense of his or her life in a world that's oftentimes absurd and produces a lot of angst. We often don't, even if a person has faith, we don't know exactly what our faith is asking us to do because things are confusing. And so you'll see some of the early themes of, themes of existentialism in Kierkegaard's work you will certainly see existentialist themes in Nietzsche's work, whom we just considered uh, in our last section, and in the Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky, and in other writers like Albert Camus coming into the 20th century, and certainly kind of like the godfather of existentialism, or the person who has the most kind of notoriety as you talk about this philosophical movement, existentialism is the philosopher we're talking about today, John Paul Sartre. So what is existentialism? Well, uh, for an existentialism uh, believes that human beings don't have a fixed essence, a fixed essence. Um, when you think about a tomato, or if you think about a cabbage, or if you think about an apple, or a tree, or a rock, or a cloud, or any being, any phenomenon of being, um, it has a fixed essence. A cloud can have many different shapes, but essentially it's water vapor that floats through the air. A rock is essentially a very hard, compacted mineral made of earth products and you know earth compounds, iron, ore, granite, all those other things, basalt. Um, a rock is a rock. A turtle is a turtle. An apple is an apple. An onion is an onion. Uh, rocks and other things that I said, uh, oranges and tomatoes, they all have a fixed essence. When, you, when a child looks at something that's orange, you say tomato. When they look at something kind of oval and round and red, they say, uh, excuse me, tomato or orange. So these things have a fixed essence. But for an existentialism, a human being is different from any other thing in nature because 
I've used this image many times before. A human being, and I'm not trying to be male here or to be uh, exclusive, just that's the only image I have of human. Um, a human being doesn't have an essence. And what I mean by that is we create our essence by the act of our existence. So let me bring that down to earth a little bit. We create our essence. A duck or a geese, ha a goose, has an essence. It has to fly south whenever it's in weather that's starting to get cold. So if you are a goose in Alaska and the weather starts to change in August and September, a goose, depending on what kind of species of, of goose or it is, will fly down to Argentina three or four month travel from Alaska all the way down to Argentina so that it can end in January um, on the Argentinian Pampa and, uh, and be in nice warm weather in the Southern Hemisphere. A goose has to fly south for the winter. It's embedded in its nature that it must act like a goose. A turtle must lay eggs in the sand. A white shark must eat and be a predator, an apex predator. A killer whale must do what it's due must do what it does. The COVID virus must do what it does. A fungus or a mold or a bacteria must do what it must do. But a human is unlike that. Humans don't have a fixed essence. Now you might say we have a biological essence. I have to sweat. I have to eat and rest and, and move and have activities and exercise my mind. Yeah, there's certain things that I do as a human but it doesn't have to end up in any particular profession or activity. I could be someone who just, if I have enough, if I'm clever enough, can create my own wealth or just kind of drop off the grid, live in a bus, live in New Mexico, and just kind of travel freely, picking up whatever money I can to support my existence. Very few people do that, but people can do that. We can live in every corner of the globe, from Antarctica to the North Pole, and in the Amazons and in forests, you know, in Everglades, in deserts, human beings can adapt all over and create culture. Now, there's things about us that make us human. You know, we live and we die and we have biological needs, but our minds can fashion our own identity. No one has to be specifically a male, a male with male particular characteristics. Sure, many of those things are given to us by biology and by nature and by nurture. But a human being can decide how aggressive and how um, masculine one wants to be. Same thing for a female. Women don't necessarily have to have children. Now, you might say, well, of course, we need to populate for the species. But is that a necessary thing that everybody do that? Or can human beings, male or female, opt not to have children and to create their own kind of identity? And that's what a existentialist would say. A human being creates their own essence. So going back to the, the theme that you will see in this reading here, one of the first things it talks about is that um, existence precedes essence. Existence. First, we are born. We exist. The clock starts running on our life journey. We, we're here as a child. We're here one day, then two weeks, then a month, then our first birthday comes. We are living our life in a linear kind of fashion. And in the course of our life, we are becoming the person that we are. Yes, we have a kind of a human nature, but we are creating our essence by our choices. We have biological impacts and you know even genetic impacts. You know, children have a certain kind of personality. But Sartre would still say there's something about us that's free, unlike any other thing that's in nature. So another thing that you'll see in the reading is that Sartre will talk about two kinds, two kinds of being. There's the being en soi, in French, en soi, meaning being en soi, in itself, and being pour soi, for itself. Being en soi, being in itself, and being pour soi, being for itself. So this is being in itself. It can't do anything. Other, you know, I brought some kind of manufactured things that we have you know, at Home Depot. So this little tape measure is something that has a fixed essence. It's already been given this essence to be this particular product by a human designer. Okay, It has a certain function. This has a certain function. Scissors, really good for cutting things. It's designed for that. 
but it doesn't really do that much else. You can't really use it as a hammering tool. It has a pretty specific function. It can cut paper and hair, but it can't cut wire, and it can't, you know, measure things. So it has a very limited design essence. It's been created and designed. This also has been designed, a stapler, designed to do a certain thing. It is being and being in itself. It can't really do anything to grow and to have consciousness. It always is what it is, whether it's a manufactured product or whether it's a product in nature, like a plant or an animal or anything else. Animals have a certain amount of ability to act pur soi because they have a little bit of consciousness. But the being par excellence uh, that can act for itself, being pur soi, is a human because we can decide how to create our essence. We don't have to be relegated to be any particular thing like this cup will always be this cup. It can never be anything else. A book will always be a book. It can't be anything else. The chair that I'm sitting in, the desk, these have fixed natures, but not humans, male or female. We create ourselves. So that's what a, that's why you'll hear the word existentialist, because the key thing about us is not that we're designed for some particular goal, like serving God or serving the state or serving humanity. You may want to do that. But what we principally are is a being that finds himself or herself as soon as you get old enough, 13, 14, 15, as you start to develop your consciousness, you find out that you're a being in the world and now you have to start deciding what your family means to you, what religion means to you, what life means to you, friendship, uh, what work and occupation means to you. You're gonna, we're going to be given a lot of these answers by social media, by what Karl Marx would call the superstructure, which is trying to control your brain and your thinking. But Sartre believes that human beings must create themselves. Many people do not. And you just accept all the norms and values from your society, from your culture, from your hood, from your socioeconomic status. You just accept that. But Sartre would say that's kind of a, a sad, inauthentic way to live because you are accepting the choices that society gives to you. So existentialism is an emphasis on the fact that, hey, bro, you exist. That's the primary reality about you is that you exist how you exist and what you are in your existence is up to you as you create your essence by your choices so so that's a, a primordial kind of thing you start you start to see that back from the days of, of uh, dostoevsky and in nietzsche and in kierkegaard you know this kind of sense that we're we find ourselves in an absurd world where oftentimes morality doesn't give us the, an ultimate answer to the questions about our being and what makes us happy, what makes us men or women, or what makes us have meaning. Oftentimes we don't have very clear solutions because even when we think God is going to give us the answer, we can have some kind of crisis in which suddenly God withdraws from us or we experience that and then we have this angst or this dark night of the soul and we don't know what God is leading us into, this dark anxiety. And you know, it's interesting, Dostoevsky was an existentialist, but he was a Christian existentialist. There are other existentialists, but even, even Dostoevsky realized that within existentialism, even though you believe in a supreme being like a Christian God, you oftentimes don't know what God's will is for you, and you're walking in the dark. You, you're, you're existing, but you're not always sure what you need to do. So therefore, an existentialist makes you or I responsible for ourselves because oftentimes even divine values don't help us always. So you have to take responsibility and control for who you are as a single person or as a married person, as a person that has faith, whatever. You have to decide what's real for you and what are your moral values. Other existentialists are atheists as Sartre was, as Nietzsche was existentialists, some of them are atheists. And Sartre, if you talk about morality, let's go into another idea of Sartre, morality. Uh, Sartre doesn't believe that there are any universal moral values. For instance, let's talk about typical moral values, honesty, fidelity, 
modesty, hard work, um, thriftiness, patience, tolerance, giving, you know, all of these trustworthiness, all of those are nice things. Nobody's putting them down. But Sartre doesn't believe that those values apply to everybody. They don't. They are, you know, noteworthy and honorable, but they don't fit every single person equally. The only value for Jean Paul Sartre is human freedom. That's the only moral value. If I ask you on the quiz, what is the only moral value for Sartre? Well, the only moral value for Sartre is your act of freedom. Your act of freedom. Sartre doesn't want to tell you what to do, whether to be a faithful married man or to be a, a loving Christian single person or to be you know, somebody who drops off the face of the earth and goes off the grid and lives in Baja and, and you kind of live off your, you know, live, live in a palapa and with your surfboard with your friends making Corona commercials or traveling around Europe and just being a bohemian. Sartre doesn't have any expectation on what a human being should do but you should be free to decide what you should do. Now, Sartre would also say that human beings, in your decisions of, in your free decisions, you have to understand that your freedom is going to impact other people. So somebody who decides to make an act to be, you know, hurtful toward another person, to be a bully, to bully somebody on social media, Sartre would say, go ahead and choose that. I'm not going to stop being... I'm not going to condemn your act of freedom, but just understand that your freedom has an impact on other people. If you want to accept you know, your actions and what they cause in other people, go ahead and accept it, but just understand that your choice has a kind of ripple effect. And so make your choices, whatever they are, but understand that in choosing, you are choosing uh, causes and effects for other people. But he doesn't judge you for what you should do about that. It's interesting because another concept that we should look at with Jean-Paul Sartre is bad faith, mauvais foi, mauvais foi. Meaning Sartre really has a hard time with people who say, well, you know, as a result of my socioeconomic conditions, about my sexual orientation, who my parents were, uh, you know, you've heard that song back, you know, in the day, you know, I wish I was tall, I wish I was a baller, I wish I had a girlfriend. If I did, I'd call her. You know, we, we have these kind of things where we wish, wish, wish that, that things were different for us. If only my parent had made me feel so guilty and compared me to my brother and put me in art class or made me do judo or karate or made me do ballet. And if, if, if only. Sartre, Sartre would basically say, why to you? Because he would say, look, this thing right here has no freedom. It'll always be a stapler. A goose will always have to fly south for the winter. A turtle will always have to be a turtle. will have to find warm seas and lay its eggs in the sand. That's the only thing a turtle can do. But a human being has an infinite amount of decisions and, and free choices that they can make. So when a person feels victimized by their ex external conditions, even though some conditions that people experience are horrific, you know, there's abandonment and parents that are chemically, uh, you know, addicted and, you know, kids get put into, you know, foster care programs and people are molested or abused or you grow up in a country that's torn by war or discrimination. There's really horrific things that happen in the world, very horrific things. And Sartre would still say, yes, and you are still human and you still have a choice. So choose your life, but just realize that there's also responsibilities and authenticity that, that you must have also as you make your choices. Um, let me see if there's a couple other concepts that we should talk about. Um, yeah, authenticity. Sartre would, and many of the existentialists would say, as you are working out your way in the world, this being that has consciousness and freedom as you're making your way out in the world you can't blame institutions and politicians and money and your politics and family religion dynamics and a totalitarian father or a domineering mother yes those impact you but Sartre has a tremendous amount of hope and 
puts a tremendous amount of responsibility on a human being to create a world that makes sense for you. So I was going with a, an idea a little bit earlier about back in the day, I remember in the 90s, I was alive, you guys weren't alive, but there was a very famous case and social media allows us to, you know, experience so many things historically, you know, with a click of a button. And uh, But there was a, two brothers uh, from uh, Beverly Hills called the Menendez brothers, Eric and Lyle Menendez, who basically were brought up in kind of affluence. Their father, uh, Jose Menendez, was somebody who had gotten into motion picture production. And, you know, he was a producer. He was hobnobbing with wealthy people. and uh, But he was a domineering father and kind of dominated over his wife, Kitty Menendez, and certainly over his two sons, Eric and Lyle, and pushed them and drove them to be, you know, perfect, competing, apex, predator, human males, get the woman, get the job, get the money, and, you know, make it in America. Jose Menendez had been uh, in Florida, excuse me, in, in Miami uh, prior to the uh, Castro Revolution in 1959. So he had lost his homeland in Cuba, and he damn well wanted to make it in the United States of America. So he made it all the way from Miami, came all the way to uh, Beverly Hills, and made it as a self-made man in America. And he pushed that ethos on his two sons to be competitive and, and driven, but his sons weren't copping to the idea of being driven that way. And uh, there's a story also that Jose Menendez manep, uh, uh, molested his two sons. That's certainly what the two sons two sons claimed in prison later, because the fact of the matter is they ended up in prison, and maybe you know the story by now, because they killed their two parents. One day, the two brothers burst into their Beverly Hills homes while their parents were watching TV. They got 12-gauge shotguns and just blasted their parents, turned their parents into hamburger helper, just blasted them uh, from behind, shooting their parents point-blank range and murdering them. And then, of course, calling the police, calling 911 and say, making it seem like it had been a mob hit because the, the father had money and connections, so maybe it was some business associate wanted to, to get revenge. But that never, you know, eventually the detectives started to pull the noose closer and closer around the brothers. And in prison, and in, when they went on trial, they said that their father had molested them and, you know, they just couldn't take his domineering anyway, and so they killed him. Now, Sartre died in 1980. He never heard about this story that happened, in the I think, in the early 90s. Sartre would have never heard about this story, but if Sartre had been alive and he had heard about these two Beverly Hills sons who, who killed their parents, he would have said, wow, you are blaming fate for your decisions. You are saying that even though your parents did what they did to you, your mother maybe turned the other way, never saw anything that was going on. You guys have heard of cases in which the perpetrating parent will often act out against a their minor children, but the other parent kind of turns away and pretends nothing is happening. So whatever rage the two kids had against their parents, Sartre would still say, look, the fact that you blamed it on some kind of hit is the real crux of the matter, because Sartre would say, accept what you did. You used your act of human freedom to murder your parents. Deal with that. But don't blame society for it and don't cry at your, at your uh, criminal trial. Because even though you had been molested, you decided to act all gangland on your parents when you could have called a reporter, you could have written a book, My Life with My Pervert Father, Jose Menendez. You could have written a book. You could have called Oprah. You could have gone on some kind of talk show back in the 90s. There was already a lot of media outlets that would have listened to your story. But no, you decided to act like a gangster, and then you fell apart on the witness stand when it all came down on you. Sartre would say, I'm not blaming you for killing your parents. Sartre doesn't have, he's, he's a Frenchman. You know, he doesn't have hardcore values like that. He's, he would say, I understand what you did, but accept what you did. That was your use of human freedom. And at the time, that's what you decided to do. Now accept the consequences. So that's, in a nutshell, kind of like what an existent, uh, certainly an atheistic existentialist would believe. You're here, you exist, 
You create your identity and your essence by the choices that you make. You are free, but you also have to realize that in choosing your freedom, you can affect other people. And as long as you're willing to accept the consequences of your choosing, then go ahead and act in the moral guidelines that you feel make sense to you as a human being using your own intelligence. So you can see that in the 1960s, as people were looking around for new ways to express themselves and new ways to believe that the hippie generation would look at, you know, the, the, the thinking of, you know, of Dostoevsky, of course, and of, and of uh, Kierkegaard, Albert Camus, and certainly of John Paul Sartre, and find in these thinkers, Nietzsche, and find in these thinkers kind of a, a new way to kind of just be human and to be responsible for your actions and for your life. All right, so that's enough on Sartre.